Greetings. Greetings. How you doing? My friend Ron is finally on the podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, I met Ron nine years ago. Is that right? I believe that would be correct. Or eight. Okay. I, I started driving a golf cart. I'm showing up to work. This is 2015. I'm going to work every day, and I figured out I can't believe I can make $300, $400, $500 in a day. I, was, I left a job making $385 a week. Next thing you know, I've got this job at Joyride. And there's a bunch of other guys there. And I realized, in my opinion, nah, most of them are kind of schmucks. There's a lot of just laying around at the office, a lot of drinking and partying at the office. I just want to make money and go home. I'm counting money at night because we would always bring in our cash and we would count it and we would split it with the company, 50-50. Every night, you're hanging out right there and we start talking. Then I made a friend that will be my lifelong friend as long as I'm on this earth. All right, well, that is exactly opposite of how I remember it. Really? And I just, uh, the way I got it, I got it pictured here. I don't know what color shirt you had on, but you're working your butt off every day. Open to dark. Late, open, okay. dark. That's open, the same story dark. I told. Okay, but <laughs> when I met you, you weren't having nothing to do with talking to any other humans because that would interfere with your path. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I pull up to you right beside the old convention center where we all used to hang out. Oh, that's right. And yeah. I said, hey, dude, what's your name? No, my name Adam. I said, well, I just want to tell you, I like your style. I like everything about it. I like <sighs> what you're doing. I like how you work. And you go, oh. And then you took off. Okay? <laughs> Was I that cold man? Pretty much, yeah. You're going, oh, yeah, well, I'm not used to talking to other humans about me. I don't know. That's the, kind of the impression I got. Man. Okay? So that's what I remember, sitting there at the old convention center, because we would do the uh, up the hill to take people anywhere they wanted to go. That's right. And we would go to the Lowe's, or we would go clear out the, the Marriott out there on 26th, 25th. Yeah. And that's, that's how I remember meeting Adam Pope. Eventually, we started talking a little bit more. Yeah. Then, finally, uh, our our superior, our super, or whatever, the tour guy, said, hey, we need another person around here on tours. And I said, you know what? That Adam Pope dude works his butt off. And we need to get a hold of him. You need to check him out. And he said, you're right. And then the next thing you know, we are a big, immense team of maybe five or six people that were getting the overflow of that one dude. So is that how you got it? Did well, it? now you've got. First of all, I I don't I I forgot all about that convention pull off conversation we had because it was so short lived. And honestly, I looked at everybody on a golf cart as my competitor. So yeah, I don't think I was. Man, I was so not interested. In relationships, or I, I felt like if I even had a conversation for longer than 10 seconds, I'm missing money somewhere, I'm losing my edge. Looking back on it, I don't know, it was not that intense of a situation, but I was bringing that kind of intensity to it, and it actually kind of worked out, because you admired it in some way, it sounds like. Absolutely. All I know <laughs> is that that golf cart made my entire life change around and to make me think a whole different way about everything. And it took the anger out of my life, and it put the love of the Lord was already in my life. But when I had money in my back pocket, that changed a lot of things. And that's what that job did. So just watching you work your butt off let me know that I should be working my butt off, too. And it worked that way, and we did it. Whoa. And uh, when I went to work at that golf cart thing, I had 500 bucks in my name, and that was it, period. I was living in my vehicle, and I lived in my vehicle for a good year. And for the first six months of that, nobody even knew I was living in my vehicle. And it was on the parking lot at where we parked the, the golf carts. <laughs> and that's how 
nobody cared about anybody because they didn't even know I was sleeping every night 25 feet away from the golf cart that I was going to get onto the next day. I didn't know. And uh, one day it came about that it bit, everybody knew because I needed a favor and uh, our, my good friend Patrick took care of that and uh, he went and got something out of my vehicle so that I could continue making money and mm. brought it to me and that's how the word came out that I was living in my car. Really? I forgot about that too. Yeah. So just sticking there. Within a year, I had saved enough money that I went and bought a uh, RV and was able to drive the RV to the parking lot. And the owner of the, the golf cart company was so gracious enough to let me just park that RV there. And I sucked their free electricity down and I lived on that parking lot for five years. Two separate parking lots, but the same company, same, they moved. Yeah. So for five years, I'm sucking free electricity and able to sleep inside of a bill or my own dwelling. I don't think the RV ran after the first couple months because I never took it anywhere, so I never started it. And after that, I never wanted to. And when that all came about to be gone, I just made sure that somebody bought it before I ever started it up. <laughs> and that's how that worked. I remember that. So, other than that, you know, that's been the greatest part of my life right there, you know. Well, one of the moments that you went from a guy I know at the golf cart place to somebody that I wanted to know way more than I did. Like, it, there, was a, there was a moment, and I don't know if you remember it. It was in that camper. One day... Before our shift, you said, would you like to come in the camper? <clears throat> and I said, of course, yeah, that was a great honor. So I came in, and you were making coffee. And you said to me something that I will never forget. The way you said it, you almost had a smile on your face. You may have had a smile on your face, but you said, I would offer you some coffee, but that's my coffee. And that's the end of the sentence. And I thought that was amazing. I was, first of all, I thought it was funny. Second of all, I didn't want coffee because it's your coffee. I didn't want your coffee. And there's not many people that I've ever met that are willing to break that little societal pressure right away. Just nip this in the bud of you thinking you're going to get some coffee just because I'm making coffee in my house. And I, th I thought that was hilarious. And that's how I think, man. I got, if I wanted your coffee, if I wanted coffee, I would have got my own coffee. You would have had it when you walked in the door. And that's I, I saw it. But I didn't have the courage in my life to tell someone else that's my coffee. So when you said that, it was the first time anyone ever gave me permission to say no that that's I would offer you this because I know that there's some societal rule that I need to that I'm acknowledging but I'm not gonna do it because it's mine well the deal is people want to say things and make people like them I don't care because <laughs> you know what people are gonna not like you no matter what can I help it? No. Do I have any idea what you think? No. Why do I want to try and figure it out? I don't. So why don't you? Because I'm busy. My life is mine. It's going on right between my ears. <laughs> I live 85% of my life in my head. I got no problem with that. That sounds fine. I'm never going to back down from that. I don't care what somebody else is doing in Toledo. I don't care what somebody else is doing in Fort Wayne. I care about what I'm doing right here, right now. Because that's what I do have control over. All right, let's talk about control. Why is it important for people to learn this concept of only concern yourself with what you can control? Well, my default is the Lord's in control. 
And once you understand that, everything else becomes very easy. Because if the tree falls down in front of your car, it's nothing personal. It just happened. The Lord's in control of my life. He knew that tree was going to fall before I was even born. So why am I worried about it falling right now? That's all I got. I mean, you know, basically, once you get that in your head, that the Lord is in control of every moment of your life, and he's the one who established it, and you look to him, you got no problems in the world until you do. And so most of those problems are all right here in your 85% in your head. <laughs> I went to a uh, defensive driving course one time. I was a youngster. I did some bad things and they, with the car and they said, dude, you need to go to this uh, driving course. I was not even 16 yet. I got busted for driving without a license. They sent me to a thing called um, defensive driving. And 97% of all accidents are human caused. So that means 3% you don't have any control over, but the rest you do. Mm. So that was always something that I could build on right there, you know. It's all about being who you are and being aware of what could happen. Wow. So you just mentioned when you were a youngster, you talk a lot about God. When we're together, we talk a lot about the Lord. So, you know, what's your testimony? My testimony is that I was in third grade doing a um, after-school kind of thing at somebody's house in their basement. They were big-time people about the Lord. I grew up as a Methodist, and uh, we went to Sunday school. We didn't even stay for church, but you know, we were aware. I was aware of the Lord and the Bible and everything. I made a mistake. I. I tried to read the Bible starting at the beginning instead of starting at the Gospels. That would have changed my entire life maybe a little bit sooner because once I got the numbers, I said, oh, never mind, and I went on. <laughs> so, you know, but anyway, and I'm third grade, and we're all there talking and doing our thing and whatever, and we're praying and stuff, and then the lady says, hey, guys, if you take the Lord into your heart, you go to heaven. I'm in third grade. I'm smart enough to know that's a good idea. So right. I said, take that Lord in my heart. And thank you, Lord. And I did. And that was the end of that. Now, I became a hellion just like everybody else. And for many years, I still knew the Lord existed, but I was agnostic. Okay. I felt that the Lord existed, but he was not involved in day-to-day -day operations. And then it took a while, and then I understood how it did. But that's another I don't I can't jump that far that quick so we'll get back to that some other time but in this conversation right but that's what happened I was there and just doing that and then my uh, my personal life at that time was not something that I'm I'm real happy about and I felt very oppressed and I felt very uh, abused whether I was or not, that's immaterial because I thought I was. And that's that's really what matters. And I never felt that anybody understood me. Other, Everybody understood me except for my parents. Mm -hmm. Everybody else thought I was a super nice guy. My parents thought I was an evil son of a gun. I couldn't understand. I, didn't, I couldn't reconcile that with how that worked. Can I ask why? They, what, if you give an example of what they would well, think was evil? But, well, they just anything. I mean, I used to eat with a fork in one hand and a knife in the other because I'm semi ambidextrous. Okay, well, my mother thought that that was wrong. <laughs> and so, therefore, she said, Don't do that, don't do that. And then one time I did it, she gave me a face slap, and I don't like that. And that's one of the biggest things in my life that made me what I am today because I do not like being face slapped. Mm. And if you ever face slap me, I will knock you down. Okay. Period. Yeah. And I'll be happy to do it. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that's where yeah. that was. I got out of high school, owned the world, thought I could do anything, and I could. Unfortunately, I chose the wrong things. Mm. That's all right. I mean, uh, the world was mine. It didn't matter if you already had it in your garage. If I wanted it, I'd go in your garage and get it. Wow. Thought nothing of it. Nothing. If 
I wanted to, well, I mean, if I wanted to drive your car and you didn't want me to and you didn't even know me, I would drive your car. Then I uh, got married, things happened, and they weren't necessarily good. I, I like to say that I was happily married three years, just not in consecutive order out of the 15. <laughs> That's not funny, but that... It's true. You're, you're an entertainer, so when you well, say things, sometimes I laugh. Well, because they're, they're meant to, uh, humor brings in points. Yeah. And that's why I found that out a long time ago. You know, people will re-listen to you if you can make them laugh. <laughs> and you can slide everything you want into their brain <laughs> as long as they're laughing. <laughs> wow. So, I don't know. I can't. Hit me. I mean, I, I can't. I, no, this I can't is great, it all, just, You know, but... This is what I think, you know. As time's going on, are you a big, are you a big, uh, you know, everybody's into therapy now. Oh, therapy, go get therapy, go talk to the therapist. And then they have a therapist and then maybe they almost treat the therapist like the oil change guy for their car. It's like just every, you know, every three months, every 3,000 miles, I'm going to drop in here. And and that's kind of the current thing. And I've been told that and I don't, I don't necessarily, I don't have one. I'm not pro it. I'm not against it. Where are you at on the whole people? Everybody needs a therapist, like an old change guy for their car. People need to know themselves first. They don't want to find out who they are. So they go to other people and let them try and tell them. Wow. That's what I think. Yeah. If I need therapy, I go to Proverbs. Everything is very, very simple. Because we're only on the planet for an, a millisecond. So, why are you going to try and make it into a big deal? <laughs> that's why I love you, Ron. I mean, it is the truth. Oh, that's what they call it, the truth. Another thing that I learned from you is that reinvention is okay. Oh, yes. It is one of my most wonderful things that I can do. And I'm looking forward to doing it in the next couple weeks. So Yeah. I'm just about ready to get reinvented. I'm a little concerned about being 66 and reinventing, but that's maybe making it more exciting because everybody can't do that. Right. But I could. Oh, absolutely. So, you, you can and you will. And I will if I choose to, you know. I've seen you reinvent, well, maybe tweak. I don't, I don't see. I don't know if I've seen you do a re, complete reinvention. No, not a complete reinvent. But no. I've seen you tweak your style. Cause see, you're a brand, and this is something that you you mentioned. You told me years ago that you were a brand, and I was. It took me a minute to know what you were talking about because I didn't understand branding, which has probably been my biggest flaw forever as a musician. Because people who understand branding before they figure out songwriting and music are usually much better at aiming their music and their songwriting to the aligning it with their branding. So we start driving a golf cart. I'm just a guy on a cart, man. I'm just making money, 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 money. But you are making a lot of money, too. I mean, we're neck and neck all the time, and actually, you're there every day. I was number three on that number ten list. That's what I'm every saying. Every week. Every week. They wouldn't allow me to do tours at that point in time. I had to do it all point to point. And so I had to go out and hustle it at 20 bucks, and I got to keep 10. Right. Five bucks, I got to keep 250. Yeah. And every week, I was making about 800 bucks a week. I had never had a job in my life that even came close to that. I never had a job in my life that where I could pay my bills and still have money left over. Never. Wow. In that era, in that time, 2016, 17, your beard is long, you got the do-rag, you got the sunglasses, you got the tie-dye shirt. Everybody knows that's that guy when you go by. Oh, there's that guy. And you do the peace sign every time. So the beard, the peace sign. One time Joyride tried to change the rules where you couldn't wear a tie-dye. And guess what? You wore a tie-dye the next day. The very next day. Absolutely no problem. <laughs> I'll do it again. <laughs> and you continued to wear it. Okay. And then on your own, you changed your shirts. Because I wanted to upgrade to a collar. <laughs> exactly. It had nothing to do with Joyride. No, it had everything no, to do. that was a couple years later, but I did. I wanted to evolve. 
branding can evolve, evolve. Absolutely. And so, therefore, I did that. But the thing that most people don't, they, there's always three sides to every story. Three well, sides? Yeah. Yours, mine, and the truth. Whoa. Okay. okay. But see, the part of that branding thing, okay, how did that serve me? Okay. First off, I live in a car. I'm not washing my hair every day. I better wear a do-rag. Okay. Oh, by the way, I'm wearing a tie-dye every day. Nobody can remember if I had that tie-dye on yesterday. They don't know if I wore it four days in a row, which I never did four days in a row, but I certainly wore them two days in a row all the time. Uh -huh. But it's the same pattern, so they don't know. People don't know what's going on. Wow. It became a brand, but it was out of a necessity. Wow. Because I didn't really feel like washing my hair every day. I didn't feel like changing my shirt every day. The other thing that you said one time, a term I never had heard before, we sit and we talk about what we think, how we think, why we think, what we think. We're, I mean, me and you do that. And you said, I like thinking about thinking. Yep. Explain that. Well, I mean, I just think that if you let things just run through randomly, that's what they're going to be, random. So if you think about what you're thinking about, then you can direct it. You can have control over your thoughts. And that's what it's all about. If you can't control your thoughts, how are you going to control anything else around you? One of my, I've had a lot of uh, help in my earlier days with uh, a lot of self-help books, okay? And I uh, had one that I really liked and I always still live it to this day. What you say is what, what you confess is what you possess. And that has always been very strong. If you ever ask me how I am, have you ever heard me in my entire life say, oh, I'm not doing too good today? Never. Never. I cannot remember ever saying that in the last 40 years. If you ask me how I'm doing, I go, fantastic. Absolutely. Or really, really well. Or I'm fired up. I might say I'm fired up. But I usually am. How do you find the ability to focus on fantastic? Simplicity. I mean, I don't have to be, I don't have a broad fantastic. You don't know what fantastic means to me. Uh -uh. I don't even really know what it means, but I know that I'm fantastic. So it might be just that one little ounce that's there every day. You know, I'm always, it's fantastic because you're alive. You got the Lord looking out for you. Do I need to go further? I mean, what else could be mm. but fantastic? You know, and, oh, guess what? Somebody's going to ask you how you are maybe four times a day for your entire life. <laughs> so what are you going to do? You're going to tell them something? Oh, I just don't feel good today. You can tell them that for the rest of your life, four times a day? Uh, you know, I don't ask people, oh, what's the most miserable thing you feel like right now? No. You know, you go, how you doing? You all right? You know, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to lead them. Right. You know, what's going on, Adam? You rocking? Yep. I'm good. Yep. Hmm. I think maybe with you, I've probably answered that question 25 different ways because you're on. And so I have, I'm ready to get to the thing. I'm ready to tell you all the stuff. Because you know that's what I'm after. Yeah. You know, you know that I'm not just uh, rhetorically asking, oh, how are you doing? And you're going to go, oh, I'm good. And then we go on with the rest of our life. No, that's not what I'm doing. You know why? Because if I really don't care how you're doing, I go, hey, greetings. How are you doing? Oh, greetings. Yeah. Greetings. Yeah. Greetings. That's an open, flat thing. Okay? I don't care how you are. I'm just trying to give you a hello. Yeah. Greetings. Greetings. That's, I've been doing that for a long time. Because you know what? If you ask people how they are, they might tell you. <laughs> So you, you've always been a superstar tour guide. I figured this out when we started hanging out and doing tours. You, I remember the way you could, you were always physically engaged in your tour. Even though you're driving, like a lot of people have both hands on the wheel and they're going, ar, 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 over there on the right, nowhere on the left, and we got this, blah, 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 blah. But Ron, you got the hand on the wheel, but then when there's a thing on the right, you're pointing, just fully invested. And over there, blah, and then over there, and there's a just a the point 
People can't see me right now. Right hand out, left hand out. All this is going on. Or both sometimes. Or both. I like that when I do that, you know, because you got something going on both sides. You put both hands out. Boom. And boom. You coined that for me. I mean, I don't know. I know that's been a thing, but you go, boom. And then the camera taken, you know, holding, I'm holding up my phone right now. I'm going to take a picture of these people. And so for years I would do, okay, this is how you've changed me, okay? I go, all right, one, two, three, boom. All right, I've been doing this picture like this. For, <laughs> how do you take pictures, Ron? Well, I do. I always tell them I'm going to take four of them. And I go, got it, got it, got it, got it. <laughs> Okay, and that way, what they're doing is they're they don't understand what's going on, so they're more relaxed. Okay, they're not trying to stage themselves. I'm not trying to get a picture like everybody's got a picture, you know, they're standing there with their hands going, Oh, hello, hey, yeah, pleasant, pleasant. No, I want the smile in their eyes, I want them to have a little grin, I want them to be completely they don't know what's going on. What's this guy doing? Other things I've stolen from you. This is actually a fun little exercise. What have I stolen from you, Ron? Your lines. Another one I stole that works every time is, um, yep, yeah, my finger is in exactly forty-two thousand pictures across America, or something. My yeah. thumb. Yeah, my, my thumb. thumb. All right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I need you to check, make sure that one picture out of all these that I've taken at each place. I say always check, make sure you like one. They go, oh, I trust you. And I said, well, yeah, I got 4,000 pictures of my thumb all across America. <laughs> exactly. That's a great one in the context of yeah. a tour. And then the other, there was one that you said one time. It was right around 2016 when Trump was running. And all of this, he's running for election. And all this uh, stuff about the Me Too movement and, you know, women going back to 1972. And some guy touched them in the butt or something, you know. And so they got to talk... All that's going on in the world, okay? Then you said something. I fell out. I thought about it for days, how funny it was. The group wanted you in the picture. We're doing a tour together, all right? I take a picture. And this is eight years ago. I'm still talking about this, Ron. I take a picture of you with this group of, of ladies or whatever. We're doing a tour with them. And... You said, do you remember? I said, I always have my hands up and a double piece sign above everybody's shoulders. Why, and, Ron? And I said, because you know why? I don't want you coming back three years from now saying I goosed you during this shot because I might run for Congress. <laughs> you said you want both hands seen because you might run for president one yeah. day. That's the way you said it that time, at yeah. least. Well, I changed things. Both hands seen because you might run for president one day. And I just thought that was so funny. And I've used that line... So I'm doing shows in South Dakota. I'm doing pictures with people. And I have used that line and gotten laughs everywhere. Yep. On the Johnny Cash Tour, 60 shows. I think 60 times I said that and got a laugh. Nice. So you're, you know, you're with me everywhere I go. And, I, and I, if I had to pay you royalties, you, you'd do all right. But <laughs> I do all right because I know you. That's the royalty <laughs> I got. But no, another thing, things you pointed out, I'm, I'm an entertainer. I go play a gig. You've been to more of my shows than I think. Actually, let me think about this. Larry Jenkins may be the only guy in the world that has you beat. I think you've been to more shows than my wife's been to that I'm playing, if they're just solo, whatever gigs. But Larry's known me since 2006. He's got a leg up. But seeing Ron in the back of a room anywhere in America that I may be playing is not uncommon. Um... The craziest thing you ever did is you drove all the way to South Dakota to watch my merch table and didn't take a dime for it. I was happy to do it. I mean, right now I'm just remembering how crazy and incredibly kind that was. Well, here's the beautiful thing about life. If you put money anywhere in the top three of your life, you don't have a good life. Now, you just said, I'm not pushing back. I want to hear yeah. what you say. Yeah. You just said, Joyride changed my life because I had $500 and then I had money. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's how it was, but it wasn't the top thing in my life. Wow, okay. I mean, you know, I mean, hey, I, I still had the Lord. I still had my, my family. 
and I still had I don't know what else right now off the top of my hand but yes I mean there's other things to be involved you know I still had to I still had your to your health your uh, yeah and I still had to be the personality I didn't let the money twist me into oh yeah yeah I can do that and then not be able to fulfill it or yeah I can do that even though it was against everything I stood for you know right okay I oh, mean I can I make that. a lot of money doing some things if I didn't have the Lord I'd be a good bank robber <laughs> You know, if money was the only thing I was living for, I would be a banker. Why in the heck would I be do, working at uh, 7-Eleven or being a tour guide? If I didn't have the Lord, I'd just go get me some money. Well, yeah. So. You simplify everything. One day I complied. I was talking about parenting. I was going through all these different things. My kids. There's another thing I remember you said. And, and I said, you know, sometimes, Ron, it's, uh, it's, it's complicated. And, and man, this is why people need, all right, people, you need friends who don't just agree with you all the time. All right. You didn't aggressively say it. You just said it's not complicated. It's simple, but it's hard. It's simple, but it's hard. And actually, maybe I added it's hard. You might not have even said that. You just said it's simple. And, oh, that helped me. A lot because I was complicating it. Yeah, absolutely. Just because you got 14 flavors doesn't mean you like all of them. <laughs> doesn't mean you have to have all of them in your fridge. You got you just one. Just pick one. Eat it. Like it. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, it's good stuff, man. And yeah, so you're in South Dakota, watching my merch table. That was a big deal, man. We got this gig opening for Aaron Watson, big Texas artist. And it was during COVID, actually. So everything had shut down, and yet they needed music, and that's how we got lucky enough to get that spot. And there's all these people there. And I just remember going afterwards to Culver's, and you actually let me buy you a burger, which is rare. But you did it for, for me. You didn't do it for you. You know, that's another thing I've learned. A lot of times, I'll go, I'm I'm Dick Van Dyke. You know, I go, ah, no, no, I got that. I'll pay for it. I'll pay for it now. You know, and you're going, no, let me do this. And, it, and I realize, oh, it's not always for me. Maybe you're just doing it for you. Maybe you're doing it for the Lord. Maybe you're doing it for other reasons unrelated to me. You it's, know why I'm doing it? Because people did it for me for 40 years. Wow. And I've been able to do it for others for three. Wow, yeah. All right. You used to drink. I've never seen you drink. And what happened? Well, I... Uh, Can I ask? Is that sure, a that's a great question. And, you know, I mean, the deal with the drinking, that's how I numbed everything, you know, because I'm very wired up. I am definitely somebody that's always talking and always pushing forward and annoying people because some people don't want to to know what's going on they prefer the tunnel vision i don't ha i don't live in a tunnel i live in a, a plane and i'm looking around you know <laughs> but anyway so one day i mean i've been drinking i mean uh my whole life i enjoyed drinking i liked it okay i mean because i would talk and talk and talk and i'd be funny and it would be just fabulous and I knew that it was getting out of hand I didn't have a whole bunch of there's a lot of expense and everything and just the fact that it's wrong okay that you you're a drunkard there's nothing wrong with having a drink I've got no problem with that I'm drinking 18 beers a day because I'm manly okay mm -hmm. I'm trying to prove to myself how cool I really am I'm going to, you know I was drinking a 12 pack and I'd buy a 24 pack because it was cheaper and that way I'd have I wouldn't have to go to the store twice, you know, I could go once. And then the next thing you know, I'm drinking 18 beers, so now i got to go to the store every day anyway, because I can't get by on six beers the next day. So I'm wrestling with this, I'm, I'm not doing well, I'm not making money, I'm not just, just not doing well. I'm standing out on the porch, I would go to church, I went to church every week on a Sunday and on a Wednesday for over a year. And then I get out of church on a Wednesday, 
and I'd run to the carry out get me a 12 pack and I'd make sure I stayed up and drink that 12 pack after church you know before I go to bed and I'm, I'm telling you I mean I am I am watching Christian TV I'm doing everything but I'm still drinking I'm thinking man this is okay I love the Lord but I can drink my butt off one day it snapped I didn't think I could do that I'm out on the patio and I'm just going Lord take this from me I'm sick of this I'm tired of drinking all the time take it from me I'm standing on this deck looking at the beautiful sky and the stars and everything and how, how can you look at that and not know that the Lord is everywhere how can you look at all that gorgeous sky and not know that so anyway I'm asking the Lord I said Lord take this from me it was the Thursday before Easter of 2015 and I go to bed, I got my 12 done, I'm going to bed, I got tears coming out of my eyes, I'm sick of drinking, I'm sick of it. I woke up that very next day and never took another drink of alcohol in my life since that point. And that doesn't happen without the Lord. You know, mm. people go, oh, well, you know, it's really tough to do and I, I really can't do this, but I'm going to do it the best I can. And, you know, if I just drink, a, if I go for a week... I'll be all right. I'll be all right. Oh, no, it's too tough. I'm going to go back. I'm just going to drink a six-pack now. I'm not going to... No. You do it. You ask the Lord to take it from you. He does. Whoa. So you better be careful what you ask the Lord for. Because you might get it. And he certainly came through for me at this point. I mean, he always comes through. I don't want to use bad terminology. But the Lord was with me. He took that pain away. You know, I never even thought... It. You don't go from 18 beers to none. You've been drinking 12 packs for over four or five years. And then you go, oh, I ain't doing it anymore. Thank you very much. And I'm done. And I never had any of this, uh, oh, I didn't have to sit around for 20 minutes thinking, I, oh, should I get a drink? Should I not? Uh, what should I? No, no. I'm looking forward. There is no sideways. There's no behind me. And that's still to this day. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Man. You know what some of the benefits of that is? First of all, you don't have to go to the restroom every 15 minutes. Plus, you got $20 bills growing in your pocket. Plus, <laughs> you get the idea that you know that the Lord really is there. And there's no question. Whoa. There's no doubt. Hmm. I, I got nothing. That's what it was. And to this day, I still, I don't, I've had more opportunity to have free beer after I quit drinking than my entire life prior to, as a drunk. I've seen it. I've, I've been around at gatherings and different things where people are just dying to give you a drink. Yeah, like, oh, come on. Yeah. You know why? Because they don't know the Lord like I do. Wow. Well, I shouldn't speak like that. I don't know what they know. That's mm. the fact. That's the other thing you do. Like you just said, they don't know the Lord like I do. You corrected yourself. You said, I don't know what they know. To me, there's a boundary there that you recognize that you're not going to get involved in their life and what they know. You just stay consistent to the earlier part of the podcast where you talked about control. I can't control them. I can control me. And so you, you train yourself to stop saying something about someone else over here that maybe you don't know maybe it's true it pop probably is true but it doesn't it's an irrelevant thing that can't be proven and isn't even in your lane to figure out it's not within your control well you got to be able to reevaluate with new information mm. a lot of people want to go down one path and they go oh i can't turn off of it because i chose this one well, no, guess what? I can put it in reverse. I can do a U-turn. I can do a 360. I can do a 180. I can do anything I want as long as it pleases the Lord. And you can even do things that don't please the Lord and then figure that out later. <laughs> and make sure that I get right on the right track. Yeah. No, I've, I don't think I've ever heard a, a I quit drinking story like that. I mean, there, you didn't do the nine steps or the twelve, whatever. You, you don't need, Do you know the steps? I don't care what they are. <laughs> yeah, nobody's drinking eighteen beers a day and without the steps, except Ron. Well, 
We no, don't know that. I don't know that. I just, for me, I like to say that's, that's yeah. great. Well, I just know that the Lord is everywhere we are, and we don't ask Him, we don't reach out for Him enough. I don't. I don't know about everybody else, but I surely don't ask Him for all the help I need. But I'm learning. So when I met you, you had a, I think you had, was it like a hatchback car? Or something? Yeah, I had a Kia Ria. All right. Then you got another vehicle. You had that a while. That was, uh, that was a uh, Malibu. That was an old man's car, they said. They said, you look like an old man. I said, well, guess what? <laughs> <laughs> You've lived in all these different cars. Um, now you're... I mean, can, can I... I'm blessed, yes. The, the Lord has blessed me. You've upgraded to this awesome van. I mean, it's it's a real deal. It's it's a... Um, you got it outfitted and everything. But it's not outfitted it's like... It's not outfitted. It's, no, but, it's got a bed I made in it. That's what I mean. It's fours. outfitted custom run. Stop. Yeah. Simplicity what, is king. And you don't even mess around with the things that people get hung up. Well, if I'm going to do it, i got to do it. i got to add this and add that. And maybe eventually you will because you always can reevaluate with new information. But what I like is how, like, I've been asked this question. Because somebody goes, well, even my wife, is he too hot out there? So what, what do you mean? Are you, are you hot at? Everything is not perfect. If you think everything's perfect, you're always going to be disappointed. See, I knew there'd be a real philosophical answer well, to this. Yeah, because, you know, of course it's hot. You know, I mean, it's inside of a vehicle and the sun's beating on it, you know. Well, guess what? I got a brain. The Lord gave me a big old brain. He said, dude, if it's too hot in there, either turn on the vehicle and get the air conditioning flowing or get out of the vehicle. I go, whoa, I never thought of that. <laughs> So oh, it's park. really cold sometimes in there, too. Yeah. You know what I do? What? I get an extra blanket. <laughs> it's really incredible. You know, you got three blankets instead of two. This is what I was hoping you'd say, because I, I I want people to know. See, I've, I've experienced a little bit of this. See, again, you gave me permission that, oh, actually, you can do this, right? Real people can sleep in a car. Well, I'm driving to Montana for different reasons over the years. I'm not getting a hotel by myself. I don't have the RV every time. Guess what? I put up shades in the window. It's going to get down to 42. Seat back. A couple blankets. All my clothes on my jacket. I sleep like a baby. Nobody think. I don't know people who actually know that that can be done. They go, well, I don't know. How, what did it, was it too this? Was it too that? You, what? You, don't, you don't sleep in a car. People don't sleep in a car. Hmm. Well, what am I? Orangutan? <laughs> I don't think so. Well, then you got like, okay, I'm watching Andy Griffith, and at night, all their windows are open. Right? And I go, it's not that long ago in history that whatever it was outside is what you dealt with inside, kind of. I mean, you had your own little... Right. You had walls and windows, but still, I, I have a wood stove. I crank that wood stove... By the time you get to the bedrooms, it's still cold. So, you know, that's what I mean. Like, I just, I like that you're not having to, oh, I got to have an air conditioner all the time, and I got to have this, and I got to have all the comforts. And that's your starting point now. Once you have all the comforts, now you can go, I need this much money. You go, I can reevaluate what comforts are important to me at different times of the year, different times of my life. And then I can save money. And and it's taught me a lot about saving, reevaluating what do I really need. Because, my, you know, my needs list can be a lot bigger than they actually are. So it's just a lot of lessons here. Well, one thing to always remember, though, everybody goes through different seasons. And I wasn't like this two seasons back. Mm-hmm. Okay, three seasons back. So, you know, one season gets you ready for another the next season gets you ready for the one coming. This season here I'm living in is getting me ready for the next one. You know, so I mean, do I necessarily believe that everybody should be able to sleep in the car? No. You know, because there's different things. I don't want your family sleeping in a car. I think your family should have a, uh, you know, the stuff that makes them a family. 
Now, a house doesn't make them a family, or makes it so it's good, but the home does. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of hard to have a home in a car. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, yeah. if you're single and you want to spend two grand to sleep in a bed eight hours a day and you don't have any money, that's good. You do you. I'll do me. Yep. Well, you are an inspiration, whether you know it or not, to people. And uh, that's one of the things I wanted to cash, capture here. This might be part one of part of 40 or one of one. We don't know. But I, I want to give you, you know, it's like a closing statement. Or what have I missed? Let's, I mean, because there's no real time it here. But also I want, I, I want it to be complete. Right, right. We want it. We want an ending point. And I haven't reached that yet. So it's going to be very difficult to do that here. To be continued.